Okay, so uh, I'm uh, Nicolas. I'm uh, working for uh, Massive Entertainment as a senior user researcher. Uh, I've been working there for the last three years and for Ubisoft for the last eight now. So I'm going to present combining qualitative and quantitative lenses and data triangulation in uh, UR testing. This is uh, fancy, but you'll see that's a fairly simple, uh, simple thing. A bit uh, of a word about us, so uh, Massive Entertainment, it's a studio that uh, was created in 97, uh, so 20 years ago, and uh, worked mostly on uh, RTS game, uh, including so the Grand Control and World in Conflict license. Then it went into the Ubisoft group uh, and uh, uh, worked on content for Ubisoft uh, IPs. Uh, mainly uh, the multiplayer for Far Cry 3, uh, content for Assassin's Creed Revelation. But all the while, um, Massive was working on their own game, uh, which uh, culminated uh, with the release in 2016 of Tom Clancy's The Division, and with the announcement earlier this year on the, of uh, the next game based on uh, Avatar uh, film uh, from uh, James Cameron. So, who are we inside uh, Massive? So the Games Lab was established in 2013. There was tests done before at Massive. But with the development of those, uh, those uh, games, uh, those new <laughs> games like The Division and Avatar, Massive wanted to step up and create like, a dedicated facility uh, just for user testing. And a uh, new room was installed with uh, everything, like 16, uh, 16 stations with uh, one mirror and all the, th all the works. The goal was to have users regularly keep well, trying the new game, confront you know, designers to real players trying their work in progress. We introduced a number of tools. We, like, observation, appreciation, uh, we use biometric, eye tracking, analytics, telemetry in general. Uh, to, uh, to support uh, this, uh, this desire to know more about who the, our users were. So, a little bit about us. What we're going to see today uh, in, uh, in this presentation, I want to show you a bit how we're de designing our test. Uh, then, the potential issue that we found from experience, from, uh, from running those tests regularly, what were the problems, the blind spot that we try to solve by using what we call here triangulation, uh, the combining different uh, way of uh, harvesting data. Bit, we'll go a bit about advantage limitation and finish with takeaway and question, uh, of course. So first of a replica of the marble plaque that we tried to have installed in our lab before being asked politely to leave the room. So that, this is kind of the philosophy that supports what, we, what we've been trying to do at Massive. Like you can see, it's evaluate and monitor currency, consistency of interconnected system, and to cross-reference them with behavioral indices, which turn culminate in a user story, simulation of experience. Most of you are roughly familiar with, uh, with this. This is not groundbreaking, but we can see already that the cross-reference aspect is you know, core to what we are trying to do. So it's natural emergence uh, that, uh, that occurred with this triangulation method that we are using. So the various methods that, uh, that we're using for testing, which is when it's time to uh, you know, start test, uh, you're going to want to choose, uh, to choose what to do. And well, we're going to, to start usually with, do I do qualitative or do I do quantitative? That's, again, most of you are going to be uh, familiar with, uh, with that. It's more like quantitative uh, is going to be you know, about the number, how much this kind of action happened, where it happened, when it happened, those kind of things, qualitative being about more finding the why, the reason behind behaviors. We, most methods are, of course, on a spectrum. It's rarely 100% one, 100% the other. And we are also using a behavioral and attitudinal. Behavioral about action and attitudinal about the expression, what people do versus what people say. Same thing, this is another spectrum. And then we're going to project our various methods on here. So this is important for us to keep in mind. This is not, of course, uh, an exhaustive list. This is a few things that we saw that, that, we, that we've used and that, we, that we've put here to kind of give you, a, give you an idea of something that, we, that we're using uh, regularly to try to, to determine be, as much as possible uh, before the test uh, what we're going to do uh, based on what we want to get, uh, the kind of result we, we want to get and question want answer. So 
the important thing is that you're going to want to choose, if you're choosing multiple methods, you're going to want to choose methods that are not too close to each other. You don't want to end up with redundant results. You want to avoid, right? the closer the methods are going to be to the other, the more confirmation you're going to get, but you're going to hit a point of diminishing return on you know, the, how interesting your results are. So when you say actual, you're going to have also have to keep in mind that context is key. So this is one of the most important things to do, trying to get a more holistic view of, uh, of, the, of the issue. And there is really that there's no one size fit all solution. You're going to try to have something that is specific to your demand. There's going to be a list of constraints, trying always to keep in mind your limitation, the request from the team, what your developer want, what you can get, the resources that you have, etc. And a list is going to emerge from that because you're going to have to remove so if you're saying this I cannot do, this I don't want to do because it's useless here, those kinds. So if I can inject a bit of a foxy saying, yeah, if you have eight hours to cut down a tree, spend the first six sharpening your axe and you want to prepare your tool to be as uh, incisive as possible and that starts by choosing the right method and then in the, uh, with those methods have the yeah, sharp, sharpen your analysis, make most of the work before the test so you don't end up getting swamped uh, by result. Uh, this is the swamp by result. This is yeah, the, what we call the shotgunning the problem, trying to you know, launch everything. We have, a, we have a question from the development team. We're trying to, we, you don't have a lot of time to prepare something. You don't have uh, really an idea of how, on how to get that and you try to throw everything and see what sticks. Uh, this, yeah, this is not a right way of doing things because you're going to get lost in the data. You're going to get a huge pile of numbers and you're going to have to sift through that uh, with a fine comb and you're going to get overwhelmed and you're going to hit a point that, well, first of all, more data doesn't equal better insight. You want data, but we found, we experienced that not enough data is rarely a problem. And this is a problem that is easily solved by planning the next, the next test. You're always doing another test, another test. We do, counterintuitively, we did not really necessarily expect that, but more too much data end up being a much more important problem. And one of the most important issues with that is you end up with what we call the Rorzak problem, is that you get such a vast amount of data that is not prioritized that you're going to be uh, able to play connect the dot and basically make any picture that you want emerge from that. And you have this problem, but you're going to also end up spending more time trying to fight other people interpretation, people that want, that will support their preconceived theories. We work in an industry, we work with creati crea creative people, they're going to be egos, they're going to be uh, people that are very invested in some decision uh, beforehand, and you don't want them to be able to kind of try to piece together, if they have access to that data, you don't want them to be able to try to piece together a Frankenstein justification uh, and read whatever they want just because you have something that is so exploratory that, yeah, you're just getting, uh, getting whatever picture you want. If we take a look uh, at appreciation, so let's say that you've, uh, you've chosen everything, you want to do appreciation and you're going to want to do a, to do a survey, you want qualitative and uh, attitudinal. Uh, one of the reasons that we choose that example is it's one of the main tasks of most uh, game uh, development uh, studio. It's one of the main tasks given to, uh, by development team to user researcher for a variety of reasons, one of which is uh, it's simple. Uh, to put in play, it doesn't necessarily require complex tool. It doesn't necessarily require the always complex, uh, long uh, analysis. And also, to be honest, because a lot of developers are not familiar with game user research and what we can do, and the, the simplest question that you get is, do up the player like the game? So this is something that we end up doing uh, a lot. And there's a lot of, uh, of uh, important things. I mean, it's interesting. I'm, I'm not using it as an example to disparage it. This is the only way to categorize user perception. This is uh, very important to do. But you need to keep in mind that it is not without issues. It is not easily actionable. It requires a lot of uh, input from the user researcher to be able to use the, the, what the, us that the user are saying. Uh, it's difficult to prioritize sometimes. What's important for players 
uh, is not necessarily what's important for the game development team. Also, uh, players will talk about what they're comfortable with, not necessarily what was most important for them. Now you're going to have five paragraphs on, a very, on something that was kind of a small issue, but the user felt very confident about what he was saying. Uh, and is going to just mention something that kind of bothers him very quickly because he doesn't really know uh, how to express it. No, this makes it difficult to prioritize. It's often too descriptive. Uh, you're going to uh, have people, I mean, we all got those kind of results when you end up with a general question about what you like and didn't like about the game and you end up with like a whole design document from the user that it would be nice if, we, if you made like Metal Gear Solid. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, yeah, again, you need a lot of, of, uh, of input from the user essential to make, uh, to make it digestible, to make it uh, useful uh, for the development team. Those are issues that, are, that you, you can mitigate them, but they're inherent to the process. They're those who are always blind spots, those are the, the yeah, it's part of the DNA of, uh, of appreciation and they're going to exist. Uh, you need to keep them in mind, not because you want, again, because you can't fix them, but because you need to know uh, what are the flaws in your tool so that you can adapt to them, so that you can try to fix uh, that, not in the, with the method itself, but by adding some, some, some other method, some, some complementary. What you want to be careful of, well, the reason you want to keep this issue, I think the, this is a quote that illustrates the problem. So making a wrong decision that happened, it's, Again, inherent to uh, all decision process, you're always running the risk of going in the wrong direction. This is not really a problem in itself, and again, video game design being like a creative endeavor, it's okay. what you want to avoid is this part, is that poor decision made with high confidence, based on, based on that, is that we're supposed to be a rock for the game. We're supposed to be where the truth is. There's going to be design meeting after design meeting after design meeting and there's going to be a lot of ego of decision of this game does that and we do that and I like this and I want to get that feeling from the user and there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. We come here to try to give a bit of certainty to the designer. And if we give that and push them in the wrong direction, well, this is a terrible uh, uh, failure uh, on our part, and this is very dangerous, and it can lead the team down the wrong path for quite a while, and yeah, this is something to avoid at all cost. Not, the worst thing is not giving, is not having no result, is not being useless to the team. This is a risk that we're always running, uh, whether they don't take into account your result or because you did not expect. But this is not the worst thing. The worst thing is actually being taken seriously, having a team that is very enthusiastic to integrate their result in their design, and having a flawed uh, interpretation of the, donor, the data that we got. One of the way we solved it is the discombining of the different lenses, this data triangulation that, uh, that I talk about. And uh, the main, the first interest is fairly obvious. It's commonality. It's finding you know the common thread in your data. And well, let's say you you take you decide to do, well, appreciation, you're thinking, oh, let's do a focus group, we're going to be get into depth, I want to see what the group dynamic is going to make pop up, like what perception that the user kind of get to as a group, this is something interesting. So you're going to, within the confine of that test, you kept in mind the limitation, you have a scope, you, uh, you try to whittle down as much as possible uh, user content, you have an idea of where you want to go, and you're going to get a series of data points. Most, some of them less interesting than others, but you know, you, you have, you have some, uh, something to start to analyze and to, uh, and to give the team. Uh, but yeah, you're going to you know, be, uh, be vulnerable to the issue that we already talked about, to the blind spot that are inherent to that method. So what you want to do is add another thing. So we use the focus group, it's qualitative, it's uh, attitudinal, and let's add, uh, for example, behavior profiling with telemetry which is uh, behavioral and uh, quantitative, you're going to add more data points, but the very in the interesting thing are going to be the commonality between the two. And here you have a highest confidence because the two methods are different, behavioral, qualitative, quantitative, etc. <coughs> there is um, no overlap of the inherent problem of the blind spots of those two methods. And that's why it's important to keep in mind the chart that I showed at the beginning, because you want things that are far enough apart that they don't have the same uh, the same problem, the same blind spot. And of course, the more you're adding uh, methods, the more commonality you're going to find. 
of the, the number of points that are going to be confirmed by all methods are, of course, fewer, but you have, you know, you have a highest confidence in them. And that's going to be the most important thing. It needs to be the core of your report. It needs to be the meat. It needs to be where the trust, the confidence of the team is. And it's a lot easier to argue for it. The second one is what we call here supplementation. So supplementation, it's, uh, to explain, to explain, I'm going to use a, a bit of a metaphor, uh, it's the, the cylinder and you're trying to, you cannot see the cylinder, you're trying to guess at the shape and you're going to be able to project a light on it. If you project a light from one side, you're going to get a rectangle. If you pro project a light from the other side, you're going to get a circle. Both are true. The circle and the, uh, and the rectangle are true. There's an objective fact is that, yeah, there's a rectangle shadow or there's a circle shadow. And so on its own, you're not going to be wrong. Your interpretation is, oh, I see a rectangle shadow, so I'm looking at a rectangle because you only have one perspective, you only have one view because the method that you're using cannot illuminate your problem from the other side from, uh, and get you the complementary information. Like this, uh, I'm thinking also about the, the parable of the six blind men and the elephants. They all are touching different parts of the elephant. They're all guessing something different, a spear, a tree trunk, a, a snake, or whatever. And they're all right based on their senses. It's not the stimuli that's wrong, it's their interpretation because they have an incomplete vision. And the danger of the incomplete vision is, again, wrong result with high confidence. So I'm going to, to illustrate those points with a couple of examples. So those, uh, like I said, this is a method that is uh, something that kind of emerged from our work, or the, the, the regular testing that, we, that we've been doing uh, at Massive for, uh, for the last uh, well, four years now, actually. Uh, and one of the games that we tested was SourcePark, the Fracture But All. It was not developed by Massive, but there was some help, and so the, the team asked us for, uh, for a few tests, and we are more than happy to comply uh, for two reasons. It was interesting, it helped. This is also our job. Uh, and it allowed us to play and test SourcePark, which was always fun. So what they wanted to know here, we had, we had, there was a walkthrough. So it was uh, almost, almost a week of testing. And there was a significant chunk of the game, not necessarily beginning to end, but a, a, a huge portion, enough to get, uh, you know, good the, to give the player a good perception of the, of the game. Uh, and the, the team had like, two main uh, questions. Well, oh, do the learning phase work for do the player notice understand and put into action the mechanics that we, uh, that we want them to use throughout the game out of the various points where we introduce those mechanics. And, uh, well, do they like the experience? Do they, do they like the game? Are they, are they having fun? Uh, so with those, we decided that, uh, well, first of all, we wanted to check uh, the learning phase. The easiest thing to do is bring the player in, just observe and not done every time there's point of friction between user and the, de and the design. Uh, the second thing, if we want them, to, if we want to know if they have fun, we're bringing quite a lot of players, so we're going to go with surveys, and we divided the game in six uh, segments of roughly equal uh, size, and uh, at the end of each of those segments, we to insert a small survey gauging their perception of the game in general and of various uh, specific aspect, what do you think about the fights, about the story, about different, <coughs> you have a bit more granularity. And the last thing that we, that we decided to, uh, to put in was uh, telemetry. Uh, the thinking was observation uh, will give us, you know, the qualitative uh, look that we, that, that we need to know. If something is not working, we need to know why. Why are the players, why is the learning flawed? Uh, but since the, the team were, uh, were interested in why the, um, why, how plutôt the, the, the learning phase might impact how the players were using the mechanics throughout the game, I wanted to have a broader look at behavior uh, of, the play, of the user, of the players throughout uh, the, the whole experience. And telemetry was the easiest way for to achieve that. So we asked uh, if we had a couple of flags about you know, uh, the interaction of players with the world. It was the, the big uh, question for us, so about like, ca cash looted, e equipment, uh, artifact equipped, those, uh, those kind of things. So the first result that we got, so direct, the, from, the, from the direct uh, observation, 
ones, there didn't seem to be uh, huge issues with, uh, with the game. The players seem to learn quite quickly and correctly which, uh, which were the main mechanics of the game and they didn't have any, uh, any trouble uh, playing for all. There were no blocking issue. There were no players that ended up like, losing constantly a fight because they didn't really know what to do. Uh, there was a few things that were unclear on more advanced mechanics, but over, overall it was quite, quite a success. We, we, we were thinking, okay, so we can, we probably will be able to go back to the team and tell them, yeah, it uh, seemed to work. Uh, we still started to see when, when talking with each researcher talking, something like, my, my player didn't seem to use quite as much the mechanics as yours. You are, and we started to think uh, some players seem to try to explore as much as possible and try a different way to combine their power and to, to use the game systems. Some on the other seem to be doing the bare minimum so they can progress. And it's, it's a bit worrying because it can indicate that lack of engagement which is going to result in you know, lack of enjoyment uh, of the experience. So the second one was the lab survey we're talking about, and here the lab surveys uh, well showed us there was two results that were far uh, far above the other. The first one was uh, everybody seemed to love the game. The players were mostly uh, were console players and familiar with the South Park brand uh, because that's what the team wanted to know on that specific target. And they seemed to understand it. They love the game. They said, "Okay, this feels like a South Park. This is fun. I like it." I'm finding my character, the story is uh, very enjoyable, so very, very high rating here. Uh, mostly, uh, let's say, a five out of five, but uh, and with a few uh, four out of five uh, thrown in there. And general appreciation of the game was quite high uh, because of that, mainly. And we had some, something else that kind of copped up to the top was that uh, a subset of the players were saying that they liked the fact that the mechanic of the game were deeper than the first one, the, the, the game mechanics of the RPG and the fights were deeper than the first one. And they enjoyed, they, they were saying like, I love the first game, I did just miss the fact that it wasn't necessarily very deep as a game and there's clearly been an effort put in with deeper mechanics here and I appreciate that. Well, again, rather positive result. We were starting to get quite exciting, uh, excited about uh, giving that back to the team. And we took a look at the telemetry. And the telemetry uh, confirmed uh, our finding that yeah, some players were clearly playing the game a lot less than others. Uh, they were a lot farther, that, that's what the observation is. You have, after two days, some players are a lot farther in the game than, uh, than others. And we realized that uh, the, the telemetry showed us that they were equipping a lot less artifacts. Basically, some of them just equipped once, maybe changed it during the, the learning phase, and then kind of stopped. They were uh, looting a lot less. Basically, they were, they were getting, as object, when we looked at the numbers, they were basically getting the minimum that was possible to do, that you, you could get on the main pass. So they were playing enough of the game that, so that they could continue progressing. Another thing that was interesting is that there was no block. There was no, at no point that the, that the player didn't do enough that they, that they needed to you know, stop and, and grind. It was just that you know, they were playing the game with barely any exploration and things like that. Uh, and we had the idea of trying to confirm results. So we were thinking, so those players are less language, and it probably explained why some of them, like I said, were kind of five, really enjoyed the game. And so the player, more, yeah, I liked the game, but they were not, you know, del deliriously happy about it. They had some, clearly some, uh, a few, like the, the experience wasn't as great as it could be. And we, we were thinking, yeah, they, are, they, are, uh, they seem to be less language, they interact less with the world, which meant less engagement, which means less enjoyment of the experience. And when we run that correlation between player rating and uh, the telemetry and what their behavior in game, uh, the complete opposite happened. As we realized that there was a, a significant negative correlation between interaction with the world uh, and enjoyment of the game. And when we looked a little bit deeper, you know, then in the survey and our results, and I started to, to realize why. Is the, 
So yeah, we, we, we start to, to, to look at our different results to try to identify why, why is that? Why do we run that strange, that strange correlation? And uh, yeah, the realization was, sure, they liked the fact that the game was deeper. They liked it, but they actually liked it intellectually. They wanted to like the fact that that issue with the first game, and they saw that, oh, so it's solved, so I like it. But those deeper mechanics kind of put the player out of the South Park fantasy. Basically, they were playing a better RPG game, but when they were playing the RPG game, they were playing less of a South Park game. They were less playing an interactive South Park episode, which, which is why actually the players that were doing the bare minimum, they were not doing the bare minimum because they didn't like the system or because they had a specific problem, they were doing the bare minimum because they had no interest in those systems. They, they, there was nothing blocking, but weirdly enough, the best experience was not the people saying, I like the story, I like the mechanic. It was the players saying, I love the story and I don't care about the mechanics. And this was a surprising result, it's something that was, uh, you know, not what we expected and that was important to, uh, to report to, uh, to the team. And not to make the mistakes of telling them, you know, you should push more, you should push the mechanic toward the players that are using them less, you should try to, because we would have basically told them, hey, try to pull out your player out of the experience more. And that would have been, of course, very dangerous for, the, for them to do. Uh, the second example, uh, the second case study here is a test that we did for Tom Clancy's The Division. It was very early in the, in the development of The Division and it was one of the first ten we, of the first tests we did as the new massive games lab officially. It was, since it was very early, we worked on a on very simple prototype and we were at a point where the UI team were thinking uh, which are the tools, so here is our game, here's what we want to do, here's the kind of experience that we want to craft for the player, and now is the time to ask ourselves what are the tools that we want to give the player to support uh, that experience, to make them able to play as best as possible the intended design. And they were thinking about uh, navigation, it was the point where they were telling themselves do we do a minimap? This is a 3D exploration of Pearl Moon. Do we do a minimap? Do we do a compass? Do we go full uh, 3D navigation tool? Uh, do we do, you know, they had, they had a lot of different questions and they started working on different elements. And they asked us, okay, so we, we have different elements. We have our minimap we have something, and we'd like to test this minimap and see if something is wrong with it, if it works, if it's something that we should keep considering or if we can uh, start thinking about something else. Uh, well, yeah, it was very interesting, quite a simple test and we decided uh, to, uh, to run, well first of all, uh, the game was very prototype stage, so there wasn't much to it, there wasn't much UI element, there was basic game control and we had some part of the map. So we, do, we designed a test where uh, the player simply had to go from point A to point B, B to C, C to D, and then back to A. We define what we consider the criteria of success. We, we define limits on how much time they could get from point A to point B. And we decided to put observation so we could, we could watch them if they went from point A to point B, were they using optimal route or were they turning around, were they a bit confused about where to, to go, uh, and was the minimap helping them, helping them uh, in that task. Uh, the second is uh, they wanted to know also if the player liked that ki those kind of elements in game. I mean, were they going with the minimap? But if there was a rejection of, no, I don't like minimap in game, maybe it was something to keep in mind. Uh, since we had the player coming one by one uh, to, uh, to test you know, a small, uh, very small portion of the game, we decided on interviews rather than surveys of focus group to have each individual opinion and to be able to dig a little deeper if we felt the need to. So we, we decided to do interviews. Uh, and uh, the last thing was, uh, we were thinking this is a UI test. It's a short uh, test and it's on simple element. And well, this is where biometrics shine. So let's do eye tracking. If we have any issue with the minimap, we want to see maybe the player don't look at the right spot. Maybe they don't look at it at all. So hey, we're going to have our heat map. Since it's going to be shortest, we're not going to be overwhelmed with, uh, with information. Perfect, let's do that. And so that's what we did. The observation, well, observation, run, uh, we run something that, that was uh, very simple when we ended up with a result that were none of the problem had any issue. 
and that was it, basically. All our tasks, we defined parameters for success. All the players were well within that. They started the game, we gave them one minute to get used to the control. We gave them the control list. As I said, it was very early in the game. And once they had the character in hand, we asked them to go from point A to point B. Few seconds to get their bearing and point A to point B. And after that, they all did the minimum time possible between B, C, D, and uh, back to A. Uh, so, well, there's no problem. The UI being basically, well, only the minima, the, we, the conclusion, the preliminary conclusion seems to be it works and the UI, uh, the minimap is useful because since it's the only thing that they can really use and they succeeded, well, so that was good. Then we had the interviews and that's where the thing started to get a little bit weird because we asked, uh, we wanted to know, you know, do you like the element? We started with knowing the question, what did you think about, uh, about what you played? How, how are you feeling about, uh, about the experience you just had? This kind of thing. And we actually had to, we were very happy to, uh, that we went with interviewing because we had to dig. The opinion of the player on the minimap was basically if we could have put a shrug uh, in, uh, in the report, that's basically what it would have been. Nobody had anything to say. I think like, the verbatim would have been, what do you think about the minimap? Well, this is a minimap, player 12. That's not, that, that was the level of information that we had the first layer. The second one was where the surprise came in, is that we have a significant portion of the player, I think close to a third, if I remember correctly, that forgot that there was a minimap. So they were playing the game, then they come back, they leave the, the chair in front of the game, or I think they might just have actually swiveled toward us, and we are asking, and literally less than one minute later, what did you think about the minimap? There's no minimap in the game. <laughs> okay, so apparently uh, our previous conclusion was really, really, really wrong because, you know, I couldn't even, some of them said, oh, uh, I don't remember there's a minimap and some of them were, you know, quite emphatic that, no, there's no minimap in the game. So since it was a non-leading question for them, we were just asking a random thing, so, there's no minimap, next question, okay. So uh, we were okay, so maybe it's not working that well at all, and you're going to need to think about, uh, at that time it was mainly, well, probably they didn't notice it, uh, so you need to change position on the screen, you need to increase visibility, maybe increase size, there is something to work on, maybe uh, have it a pulsing effect when it starts, uh, when the player come out of the menu, something like that. We were on those you know, very basic uh, UI uh, thing, to uh, you know, make the player notice because they, did, they don't know about it and it's worrying when the, right now you have a very simple game when it's almost the only thing in it. It's going to be a lot worse when you have element cannibalizing the, their attention. And then we look at eye tracking because we're saying, okay, if we want to change the position, we need to know where are they currently looking? Is there another element that are attracting their attention? Are they naturally looking toward, the, toward another part of the screen? And then, yeah, then put the element there. Uh, and here we had our second surprise, actually. Uh, all of the players were looking at the minimap. Not only they were looking at the minimap, they were all immediately looking at the minimap. Uh, it was basically, uh, I simplify it, but basically they were all starting the game, looking at the character, looking at their weapon, looking at the minimap. Within the first 10 seconds, they all had looked at the minimap. And they all kept looking at the minimap throughout the whole test. We had an average of seven fixation per minute from beginning to end of the test. And they kept looking, they kept looking, they kept looking, which meant that literally their gaze was, went almost from the minimap to the observer and saying there is no minimap despite the fact that they were reading it. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a problem. So let's go over it one more time. Let's try to take a look at, uh, at where, where the problem might be because they don't know the minimap and they, they kept using it. There's either something is working very, very well or something is going very, very wrong. So, uh, and we, we take another look at the situation and, uh, and go, went back over the interview. The advantages of an interview is that we were able to get in depth and since we were a bit surprised by the fact that they didn't know about minimap, we also ask in question, oh, there is no minimap here, okay, sure, but what did you think about minimap in general? Why, why do you like, which kind of UI element do you use the most in which type of game, etc. And going over the eye tracking and uh, going to the conclusion, how fast they were looking at it, how they kept glancing at it, and, uh, and 
the, the, the pattern, the gaze pattern, meaning that they were looking at really only what was useful, the fact that those were people that were used to uh, open world and, uh, and uh, third person shooter, uh, we came to the conclusion that the minimap was working very well for what it was doing, but with what it was doing was almost nothing. And that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the issue. The issue was not the visibility, was the information. They were only using it for navigation, which was such a, ba a basic task in the game that they were doing it unconsciously. They were dismissed, since there was nothing at that, uh, in that space that they were uh, expecting to see on the minimap. We had actually people in there saying, oh, I like the minimap because I can find loot, I can find enemies, I can find... They all have different expectations, but that's the thing, they had expectations, and none of them even mentioned navigation, except when prodded by the moderator, because it was such a basic thing that, and they're so used to that, that they used it, and automatically dismissed it. It wasn't even worth remembering, it wasn't worth using actively uh, in their mind. And so that's the, that's the why we got the answer that, oh, there is no minimap despite people keep reading it. Okay, so I hope that it was uh, clear why those different methods were useful, uh, why we would have given if we had used only one of the methods that I talked about, on, uh, that I talked about either on South Park or uh, on the division, we would have given the team a wrong answer and they would have acted on wrong uh, uh, interpretation of, uh, of our results. Uh, there are limitations, of course, if you want to do more tests that you want to run, we need to, you run, need to run a different medals simultaneously for, uh, for one test. This is going to, you're going to use more time, which is why we get back to need good preparation. You need to uh, do what you need. You don't go exploratory with like six kind of different methods, otherwise you're going to get completely overwhelmed for analysis. But yeah, it's going to take a little more time, you need to get in your mind. Other results is going to cost a little more money, you need to have tools. We talked about appreciation, what it was used, because you know, you have a pen and paper. If you want to add biometrics, well, you need to buy the tools if you want. So it's also to keep in mind, but it's well worth it if you want to have the best interpretation, and if you want to be as incisive as possible and as useful as possible for your designers. Uh, you look also on the risk of uh, over analysis. It's kind of getting back to the problem that you can have even on one testing method. The Rorjak issue that I was talking about, getting overwhelmed with a huge amount of data and starting to pour over every little detail and make mountains out of molehill, basically. You're going to start every little discrepancy between two, uh, between two different sources of data and you're going to start obsessing over it. And you have to, you know, that's where also good preparation helps. You need to kind of know where you're going first so that when there is a, a surprise, like we had in Division or South Park, you're ready and you, you know where to go to try to know why that this result is, an, is unexpected. The advantages are clear. Well, first of all, you're not doing mis you, you're going to avoid giving wrong results to your team, which is a pretty important uh, advantage. The second one is you're going to also be able to, uh, to look deeper into, into issues. Le, like for example, if you're going, you are, you're uh, noticing a behavior uh, with qualitative with telemetry, and you're going to look at qualitative results to go a bit more in depth into, you know, the why. Why is it happening? We can see that's happening in general. Why? Or it can go the, the other way around. Also, you can try to put in context to try to shift your perspective. You, you're noticing uh, qualitative is noticing an unanticipated behavior perception. You're going to look at how it affects the overall dy dynamic of your game, and you're going to try to take a broader look with a quantitative uh, method. So this is how we're doing tests uh, right now uh, at Massive. We're defining our, our hypothesis, talking with the team, having a really clear idea of what they want. Uh, and well, sometimes it can be hard because they might not need, uh, they might not know what they need and what they want themselves. And so it's a lot of discussion. It's being involved with the design all the time. It's constantly being in the, the meeting, even if you're not just here to listen, because when, you, when you're just here to see their process, you're going to have a more intuitive understanding of the direction they want to go in and how you can end that. You're going to define your constraint, your limitation, and that's going to, well, get you to uh, do a list of tools that are available to you. Hopefully, uh, a shorter list if you consider your demand, your constraint, your client. Then you're going to collect your data, that's testing and then compiling, uh, compiling your results. 
then that's where you cross-reference everything. That's where you look. Not, you don't report the result each separately. You don't do your compilation of appreciation and, and put that in a nice part and then do your telemetry and uh, have a nice section on that. You look at it. You want to do a consistent whole with your, with your report. Uh, same, kind of same thing as in the game. You don't want mechanics to just stand on their own and be good on their own because that's not how people judge the experience. They judge how it mesh well together. Try to do that with your reporting also. And that's going to get you the best result possible. It's going to be, uh, you're going to be able to validate or invalidate your, your hypothesis and get something that is precise and with a, a hard foundation of confidence because you have multiple backing, multiple sources and then back to a new hypothesis because this is the unending <laughs> testing cycle. And we need to do the next one. So here's the takeaway to very simply, good preparation is essential. You need to vary your data sources and you need then to spend time on synthesis, not just having different things because you can, but having different things because you, you have an idea of how they're going to work together and how you want them to work together to give a clearer picture of your experience. Well, the simulation of your experience. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions they would like to ask? Down at the end? Get as close as I can. People can pass it. Thank you. Um, so what I was wondering is, and how far are you able to, to share these findings within like the Ubisoft studios and stuff? Because I imagine a lot of this information is very specifically catered to your one question or to your one project, but... So it might, that, that might be one of the drawbacks is that the more specific you then get, the, the harder it is it, it's to apply to another project. But uh, how much I'm allowed to share or how much I'm able to share? This is two different questions. What, uh, what, what's the, the one that you want to know about? Both? Uh, I'd say able to share. Able to share? Uh, well, quite a lot, actually. I mean, there's uh, roughly 77 people from Ubisoft in the room, and uh, we regularly uh, talk about different methodology. Uh, it's, it's not the specifics. It's talking about, you know, general what, what we put in place, what are the limitations that we found on this or that methods. Uh, we worked on different projects, all of us at Ubisoft. I mean, I work for Massive, so my main work right now is on massive project. But you know, I work on South Park, we try to always help each other. If you have a structure that is uh, big enough to, to, to get other games, we always try to do it. So I, I'm thinking the exchange of information is good. Getting, getting a specific report for somebody is interesting because you see all the different methodology work together rather than for the result in itself because yeah, you're not going to, to adapt necessarily that result to another game. But every time they're surprised, this is something that you, are, that you have to keep in mind. Uh, for example, for South Park, it kind of uh, show an interesting lesson about being careful of what you might consider uh, of what's the core of your experience. Uh, in the lab, we were thinking as you know, game user researcher, kind of gameplay first. So engagement went through uh, interaction with the world, and we were surprised. And that's a good thing to keep in mind. And that's something that you can adapt. That's a learning that you can adapt to other games. I'm not sure if I answered the question. Right. But I hope so. Um, in the beginning, you talked about um, assessing appreciation. Um, I was wondering, you said sometimes it's too descriptive. Um, do you have any methods or, or any, any best uh, practices how you can facilitate them to, to better express themselves or to more correctly express themselves? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> the, the best practices are it's all going to be analysis. The problem is that every time, so if you have a focus group, of course, a well prepared focus group with a moderator and animator that know where to go and know how to gently guide people back to the issue to avoid some players being uh, over the top and 
intimate editing, other things. Those are, of course, important. But those are, you know, best practices that are easy to find for focus group, for appreciation. It's always interesting to talk about uh, market people about that because they have, uh, they have a lot of, uh, of experience running focus group, running uh, surveys, those kind of things. But you cannot, don't try to do your analysis while the player are talking, basically. Uh, be well prepared, you know where you want to go. If you want to go to your game appreciation, do you like the game? Well, that's going to <laughs> not cut it. So you can, you know, with along with question, you know, needing, try to go in a survey. Usually what I, why I tend to go is go large and then try to go uh, as specific as I want it to be uh, later. But it, the, you're not going to stop people uh, being too descriptive, uh, except if you tell them to, you know, stop writing, please. And that's going to, uh, to be too much of an influence. So if you want to have as much as possible the unimpeded perception of the game, then you need to deal with those, uh, with those issues. And they're going to stay. The, 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 the trade-off is too important because it's going to, to, to influence what they're writing and you don't want that. Hiya. Um, I just like to say I completely agree with the philosophy of what you're talking about. But I'm interested in whether from your experience, you find that having this sort of plurality of sources um, sort of muddies the water? Does it ever confuse and add time to analysis that in hindsight you think, oh, I wish we hadn't paid so much attention to this eye tracking data that yeah. has so actually just made yeah. us spend five days longer than we needed to? I see what you mean. This is something that we expected. This is not, it seems, I mean, in retrospect, it seems quite obvious, you know, get more results, to be more precise. And a lot of people are kind of afraid of getting overwhelmed, which is a thing that I understand completely and kind of something that we expected. But no, actually. There, I don't remember any one test. When, sometimes we had results that were not, used, not useful. Uh, we look at telemetry, we started working on it, and then you think, it doesn't tell us anything interesting on the specific point. And then you dismiss it. Don't hesitate to cut. The same thing that is applicable when you prepare your, your, uh, your methodology, when you're thinking, oh, I'm going to add that, I'm going to add that, I'm going to add that, and then you're, you're rethinking about it, and then uh, that's not useful, don't hesitate to cut, same thing after. It's better to have lean and mean. It's better to have something that is uh, more impactful and simple, that's something complicated and nebulous. Uh, and cross-referencing tend to you know, you tend to concentrate when, if you remember, you know, the kind of Venn diagram that you need with the point. Since you tend to, instead of reporting all of those data points, you tend to concentrate on the one you're sure, you're more sure. Actually, it tends to help, it tends to be clearer, it tends to, uh, to try to guide your analysis. Uh, you need to be careful not to be too much influenced by one methodology. You need to, uh, to look at all of them separately and then do the synthesis. That's why I'm, I said, compile your result. And then the synthesis is another step. Don't start to work on everything at once because uh, then you're going to want the observation to try to confirm even unconsciously. So, no, the, the very important thing, again, is about preparation. You need all of those methods. You always need your test to be very well defined. But here, if you're doing multiple uh, data streams, then it becomes, yeah, it becomes essential. Otherwise, you're not going to, uh, to have the, the time and you're going to get lost. But otherwise, it's, it's a source of clarity, not confusion. Uh, so not really got any time for any more questions. Um, so thanks again to Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs>